Apollo Road 003 with Ross Lunds. Ross is from the, quote, hilly little civil war town of Vicksburg, Mississippi, unquote. He's an interesting guy. I met him through my father, Damien, and he is no stranger to the show circuit, although that came later in his career. And man, he's got an interesting career, um, not just limited to the arts. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Ross. Um, I think it'll be one of many to come. And by the way, I'm new to this whole interviewing thing, so please don't let my interviewing skills uh, dampen the experience. Uh, enjoy. All right, sitting down with Ross Lunds. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are you, Alejandro? Good. Just doing a little second take here because of the, uh, the AC. Right. Anyway, um, Ross has been in the arts for probably 20 years, would you say? Yeah, 20 to 25 years. All right. Um, walk us through the, the basic trajectory. So where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, and although I was born in Glen Cove, New York, which is in Long Island. Um, I was in, my dad was in Vietnam when I was born. And um, when he got back from his, his requisite draft period, he, uh, we, he was a scientist to start off with. And we ended up moving to Virginia for three years for him to finish up his, his training as a marine biologist. And so, but when I was four, we ended up in Mississippi and, um, he was working at a, a lab there called the waterways experiment station, which at the time was the largest Corps of engineer facility in the, in the world. And, hmm, um, interesting. my mom is a nurse. Uh, she's still practicing. She's been a surgical nurse for almost 50 years now. <laughs> wow. Funny to think. And anyway, the reason for bringing those things up is, of course, that dictated my path. And my, uh, um, so from age four to age, pretty much age 18, 19, what I would consider my formative years mm -hmm. were spent in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I wasn't exposed to a lot of art there. The art that I was exposed to was via my dad who was a pretty amazing drawer hmm. draftsman is mm -hmm. would be a kind of a formal way to put it but he was very uh he had it came pretty easily to him to draw representational things hmm. so if he uh he did his draft period and i'm guessing that He's, he was fairly creative before, you know, he went into the military. And so I wonder if that was, was that helpful for him? Or do you think it was, you know, being a creative person in a rigid structure is a challenge? Yeah, you know, neither of my parents, for that matter, but especially my dad, didn't talk a lot about his childhood. So I, I have random stories, you know, bouncing around in my head. But there was never stories about his... Uh, artistic endeavors, hmm. definitely not. Um, but you know that what he, he did. Go ahead. No, he it, he had like a history of you know being, you know, somewhat creative and producing work. You just never really heard a lot about it. Uh, no, actually, uh, he. Um, I don't really understand his rapport with working with his hands or anything using his imagination. There's a pretty strong, in my experience, correlation between science and visual arts. There's, both of them do a lot of experimenting. Both of them have a, one of them uses a lab. We use, mm -hmm. as visual artists, use our studio. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of trial and error and almost scientific method, if you will, which is proving to disprove. And in our case, as craftspeople, 
we're trying to, um, or I, I said proving to disprove, it's the opposite of scientific method, it's disproving to prove. Right. And, but we're always, in my case at least, I'm always experimenting with form and materiality in order to um, basically disprove what the conventional association is mm -hmm. with the um, with the materials that I'm using mm -hmm. in order to prove that actually you can do something with them. Right. That's uh, definitely a common thread that I've found so far is that, you know, artists will, they'll work within some boundary and then, you know, start pushing the walls of that boundary mm -hmm. and you quickly, f you know, find new, you know, new avenues, new channels or new ideas. Right. Um, so that, that sounds right, you know, right up there with, with, uh, the other people I've talked to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit, but, uh, so Vicksburg was a civil war town. So like yeah. you said, there wasn't, you didn't have a lot of exposure to art during that no. period. No, you know, deep South is a funny place. And it was a f especially then when I think about, you know, looking back as a child, you don't see, but I was there essentially from 1972 ish, mm -hmm. you know, all the way to 1988. And, um, 1972 was a crazy time for, especially for Mississippi, mm -hmm. the civil rights thing. Sure. Again, as a four and five and six year old, I didn't feel any of right, it. Right, right. And especially because my parents were Yankees, essentially, and, and that's how we were always referred to. Mm -hmm. It is important for Southerners to designate uh, a regional or, or part of the country association mm. with, with whoever they know. And so I was always the Yankee. I was always kind of the outsider. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, by the time I got up to 15, 16, 17, and I'd grown, I'd grown up with the same people and gone to school with the same people basically my entire life. At least that's how it felt. I, you know, the, the stigma wasn't, wasn't there. Right. Anyway, where I'm going is, um, is that, it's just more of a, there's not as much room for, it's an agricultural place. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's just. So if you're, if you're kind of towing the line of, you know, the social norm in your city, then you're kind of looked at as, you know, you're going crazy or you're not, you know, yeah. someone needs to discipline that boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> something like that. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, basically along those lines, but. But back to the role of art, I mean, it just, it's frivolous, you know, it, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't something that was really encouraged as it seems to be these days, again, like, from what I can see, a person's imagination um, being uh, nurtured is a super important part of what's happening now then. It wasn't as much of a, a concern. Yeah, it was more the the three R's, you know, reading, writing, writing, and arithmetic, and right. So that was the focus of of being there. And I went to I went to Catholic school for my entire um, from K through twelve. Mm. And so, um, yeah, no art classes. Sure. Yeah. So no art classes, but then you responded. Uh, by taking the formal route with a BFA in metalsmithing and painting from Central Washington University in Ellensburg, and then an MFA in metalsmithing from the University of Kansas. So you kind yeah. of rectified the, uh, <laughs> the lack of artistic training. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, that's a funny thing because I think where at least I was always, I didn't do well in school and I was a good athlete and physical things came easily to me, but the books didn't mm -hmm. and I struggled. I really struggled and was criticized a lot for my, you know, doing poorly in school. Right. 
So when I became an adult, if you will, you know, I wasn't a teenager anymore. Uh, Formal education track. Yeah, it became a justification. Mm -hmm. It became a way of proving that, look, I'm in the university system right. and, and I'm doing really well. Right. You're good at school. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I'm getting scholarships and I'm doing all these things that I was taught to do. And I was being um, praised by classmates and by my instructors. And so I was filling that, hmm. that, that insecurity really is what sure. it was. So I know, you know, it's probably took, I just glossed over you getting a BFA and an MFA. And of course that took years. Is there anything that you remember, you know, from either that whole time period where, you know, you, you really started to get in your groove and you, and you could feel it and you knew that's where you were going to, you were going to end up. I mean, it sounds like you, obviously if you're impressing in you know, your classmates and your professors, you were probably at the top of, you know, your classes in some regard. Well, you know, that, again, that's the funny thing about the visual arts is that, yeah, of course, there's a, a standard by which someone can measure a, a student's performance and mm -hmm. or production. But ultimately, with, with art and with creativity, it's all so individual, and I think maybe with my comment about encouraged by instructors and respected by classmates. Um, yeah, gosh, and it's funny, you know, now being 20 plus years in and mm -hmm. how I judge my performance, sure. a lot of it is based <laughs> on whether I'm still able, able to survive, basically pay the bills as a visual artist, whereas then none of that was a concern of mine because it was already paid for, right. often by scholarship. Mm -hmm. And so I had all those dynamics um, tweaked, and all I cared about was creativity mm -hmm. following a concept. Mm -hmm. And Man, that was my, you know, that was my litmus for whether I was successful mm -hmm. or not. That's such a good point that you, that you just made because, you know, I think the... The creative field as a, let's say as a conceptual field is very different than that of a career path. Mm -hmm. And like you said, when you have to pay the bills, you know, your, your options are, uh, they seem more limited in a way. I don't know if you, you know, coming out of the, um, educational environment into, you know, the real world of having to pay your bills. Did you notice, um, a shift in your work or was it only the, you know, the conceptual idea of it? Yeah. I mean, when I got out of, there's a pretty good stretch of time in between undergrad and grad school and undergrad was more of a feeling like I'm a part of the world and I'm not this dumb reject, which is unfortunately the way I, could, I was portrayed in, in many ways. And that could, maybe it has more to do with how I thought of myself because I wasn't uh, performing like, mm -hmm. you know, I was raised to perform. Mm -hmm. And, um, but there was... See, I graduated from undergrad in, I think, 92, 93. And I started graduate work in 99, basically, okay. but pretty much 2000. Sure. And so that stretch of time I spent abroad, I, I traveled because mm -hmm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew the things that I liked to do and I loved, I was into photography Okay. Then, and that's where I did I did a lot of photography I've always done a lot of photography um, and so which is that's a little bit of a tangent ironic because photography is the probably the most conventionally um, accepted form of art and yeah. I even I hesitate to I know photographers would really <laughs> 
No, I might them. argue, <laughs> like art, of course it's art. Right. But still, photography is, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think that, you know, that's an interesting point because it's so transparent in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole concept of what art uh, art is supposed to be more real than life and it's, you know, portraying, you know, things beyond reality in reality and, you know, all that stuff. But photography is sort of, you almost don't notice it because it, it's literally just what you're looking at and you could, you know, right. forget that there is an artistic element to it. Right. And of course, you know, I would say that there's definitely mass production photography for the purpose of utility Mm -hmm. only. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and so yeah, that I wouldn't necessarily consider, um, you know, product images on the McMaster car catalog art, but they right. do clearly portray what the item is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, to yeah. your point, it's it it could go both ways depending on what it, what the purpose is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How it's framed mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Literally, how it's framed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. So cool. That's, uh, you clearly were grappling with, you know, how complex the, the field was early on before mm-hmm. you went to school during school, mm-hmm. you know, and then to this day, I'm sure that, um, your ideas about the limits and boundaries are different still. Yeah. 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 I mean, the difference now as a visual artist in my approach from then when I started off is then it seemed like there was a very specific way of getting there mm. being quote successful mm-hmm. now. What, what do you I think f- that was back then? Was it, um, well, then it was sh- just what I saw, um, you know, and this was before the computer and before, um, the access to information Mm -hmm. that we have now. So do you mean like getting, you know, a gallery spot or a studio opening or something like that? And then eventually getting in what a magazine or painting. Well, yeah. So one of the, I think, um, something that made a big impact on me in while I was in Mississippi was that, pretty good friends of my parents owned a gallery. It's the only gallery okay. in Vicksburg, Mississippi gallery in the form of a, of, of like fine artists. Do you know if it's still around today? Or folk artists. Oh yeah. 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 It was it's name? called the attic gallery. The attic. Cool. And it's been going on. It's sh- Leslie silver is the proprietor's name and they've had that business for close to, to 50 years now and for a gallery that's amazing and Mm -hmm. so i was exposed to that from young um probably as young as eight years old but then from eight to 18 i would go there and visit leslie Mm. and um that's a good so at the time i just went there because it was fun and it was this space with all this art in it. And right. it wasn't the gallery in the sense of like when you're in Soho, New York city and it's very formal and yeah. rotating shows and right. it's got a sense of pretentiousness to it. Mm-hmm. This place was not that way. They hmm. carried a lot of folk artists. It, most of the folks that were being um, exhibited there were people from Mississippi, Mississippi, Louisiana, from the deep South, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia. Mm-hmm. What kind of work was it? When you, I mean, it was anything from 2D to, th- so it was, it was painting, pottery, a lot of woodwork, um, but mainly painting and a, a number of drawings and printmaking. It was what now, I guess, would be considered folk art. Okay. Um, so the folks who were uh, b- being exhibited, the other artists were not as trained. They they weren't a lot often weren't formally trained. Um, they were self-taught, you know? Right. And again, then I just saw it as art. I didn't really. It was just around you. Yeah. And, but the the funny thing is, is, you know, folk art is this, and forgive me folk artists out there, but folk art is this 
funny dance between um, cartoon and or a very uh, uh, kind of primal or simplistic representation of something and an, and an idea hmm. and so um, and often it's as if folk artists are trying to be a child again in the good in in all the good ways yeah. um, the innocence and the uh, like the seriousness there's like a level of seriousness to various yeah medias and it sounds like that one is you know less of the rigid you know right. rigid uh, cultural ideas of what art is supposed to be sure yeah so right i mean the attic gallery had a, a pretty uh, significant influence i think even though uh, i haven't strongly i haven't like sat down and pondered <laughs> that but yeah talking to you make kind of makes me realize yeah well i'm glad you you know brought that up because i think one of the questions i struggle with now is whether people that are closer to my age will develop an appreciation for the visual arts and the handcrafted you know whatever it is mm -hmm. unless they have like a direct experience with it early mm -hmm. on. Right. I was fortunate that I, you know, grew up in it from day one. Right. Yeah. So it's hard for me to, you know, get out of that bias mm -hmm. and then really assess like, you know, where, where did my affinity for art come from? Right. Um, and I don't know if it was just cause I grew up in it or if it really was interesting to me individually. Right. Um, so it sounds like, you know, you had a nice, a nice, early experience and exposure to it that was you know in a very fun environment and it was very mm -hmm. you know friendly and it was mm. you could ask questions maybe or you were just you know happy to be there and so i don't know if that's right you know it's fascinating I, that you put it like that yeah yeah huh. cause, you know if you if you walk into a gallery just cold and you're you know, don't know anything about the work or you don't really have an appreciation for it. I'm not really sure if you can get the same kind of experience out of it. You know? Yeah. But yeah. if you spend a lot of time, you know, with an artist or in a studio, then you can mm -hmm. kind of see, Oh, this is, you know, I get it now. It's, mm -hmm. this, this is what it's about. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So that was, that's good to know the early on early experiences. Right. And you've also had experience teaching. So that'd be the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. So not yeah. only did you go through the formal um, training path, but then you also taught. Right. What did you learn from that? Yeah, well, I feel like I need to address the teaching bit is uh, another way that a visual artist can survive, mm -hmm. um, especially one who's having a more challenging time and or making work that's less conventionally accepted so a conceptual artist for instance is probably if they want to continue to practice going to be teaching hmm. maybe for their entire life because to survive as someone who's trying to ex express an idea solely and the idea is what's most important the concept right um it's hard to hard to put a price on that it's right it's hard yeah. to put a price on that <laughs> and and culture is so temperamental that yeah the sales are can be few and far between mm. um so Te teaching was, that was at loyola right well no yeah so i started teaching at loyola and that was i mean to backtrack just a little bit a lot of where i ended up and how I have ended up where I am. I call it serendipity or chance. I don't, I have <laughs> rarely had a like, okay, this is what I want to accomplish. It's more of, I have this kind of ephemeral idea, this uh, almost dream like idea, um, something that's tangible, but, but if when you go to grasp for it, it it's gonna, it's gonna fade away. Mm -hmm. Um, and and then I let chance dictate 
the literal path or the, you know, from, I was going to say trajectory, which isn't really right. It doesn't really express it properly. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, like chance, the- chance is what helps me. So back to the Loyola thing, I had just moved to New Orleans. Okay. Um, I had just gotten my MFA, my Master of Fine Arts from University of Kansas, literally, you know, three months prior. I uh, had no intentions of, well, I was interested in teaching, but I just, I was such a hustler anyway, always used to figuring out what I was going to do on the fly, Right. that um, I was just going to take whatever I got. And I always had a skill of doing carpentry. So carpentry, which is, you know, everyone needs a carpenter, everyone. Sure. Um, and so I was doing that. And I, my wife and I had recently purchased a house and um, to the neighbors and um, I was doing pickup carpentry. But I was also involving myself in the visual arts. I was going around from gallery to gallery trying to mm-hmm. drum up some business and I met other artists and you know we start talking and mm-hmm. next thing I knew I'm doing a sabbatical replacement for the sculpture professor at, at Loyola who was, you know, going to be gone for a year, right. essentially. And so that's where it started. Hmm. And then from being his sabbatical replacement or teaching sculpture at Loyola, then, then I got my foot in the door and then I taught design. They call it basic design, which is just introducing incoming freshmen to the university system. So is that like a, a 101 level? Essentially, okay. yeah. It's yeah, art 101. Right. But it's the studio part of it and not the book oh, part okay. of it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you had a couple interesting things there. One is that you always had a bread and butter skill that you knew you could rely on to yeah. get you through something. Right. But you didn't ever stop pushing the creative side forward. Right. And then inevitably because of that, you know, you made made some collisions with some people and then you ended up in yeah a cool spot. Yeah. I would say, I guess from the outside, <clears throat> it sounds like luck, but it also just sounds like you were disciplined enough to, you know, have the right system and the right process and let the result kind of just happen. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the system, as, as you put it, um, inadvertently would take me places that, and perhaps I had a, a role in um, where it went, meaning I had my hands on the steering wheel and it wasn't just a, <laughs> a free fall. Right. But um, yeah, inevitably they took me toward more creative type endeavors or, or things that involved the imagination more than they did. I'll use the word convention or what popular culture di- hmm. dictates. But back to your point on on um, having a, si- a, a bread and butter, I that is the um, often I think the the thing that brings circuit artists um, together is that they they have that kind of they always have a, a inner uh, drive or, or bread and butter hustle. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the craft thing is, or the making of objects that are, yeah, you know, that involve more imagination than they do function. Mm-hmm. Um, actually I'll pause you right there. Is that, this is a good distinction to talk about. So, mm-hmm. you know, art craft, I know it's different for every, ask anybody and they'll kind of have an opinion on it, but, yeah. um, do you want to lay that out real quick? Sure. Yeah. And that was always a, that was a huge debate while mm-hmm. I was in school. Um, and now the lines are, it seems, even though I haven't been involved in the university system in a while, but are being really blurred. But at the time that I was quote training formally, there was very, very, very distinct lines. Mm -hmm. And you had, you know, you had the craft camp and you had the art camp. And of course, everyone wanted to be a part of the art camp. And it was the nerds that were part of the craft camp. And 
Um, and I always found myself straddling the two. I mean, case in point is in undergrad, I was a double major. I was painting mm -hmm. and I was metalsmithing. Right. So I was jewelry and I was, you know, painting. Mm -hmm. So I, I never committed to, to one or the other. And, um, and then ultimately they melded themselves by the time I got into mm -hmm. graduate school and, and metalsmithing had been historically full on craft, like jewelry is craft. There's mm -hmm. no getting outside of that. Well, now they don't call it jewelry anymore. They call it metalsmithing and, and a lot of the metalsmiths are making what is known as art jewelry. Hmm. So they're refusing to um, commit to one side or, or the other. They're just saying, I can do both. Yeah. So um, is the distinction between art and craft that kind of the level of function on like maybe a sliding scale or is it something else? Well, so yeah, so that's the way I distinguish it is exactly. It has everything to do with function. Whereas to me, the crafts, which are historically, you know, blacksmithing, pottery, jewelry, uh, printmaking and photography too. Mm -hmm. But those, the, the, the latter two also have always had their hand in the art side of things. Um, of course, things like basket weaving and paper making and book making are always considered craft. And inevitably, all in, in glass blowing is another one of those very strange straddlers like photography and printmaking. Mm. But um, they started off who, with function being the, the primary. Uh, I mean, if you look to our history, I guess, as humans and making things, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, craft would have been, you know, your, your chainmail armor and your sword. It was you know, crafted. By yeah, <laughs> right. And the pottery that you drank from mm -hmm. and, and, and ate from. And, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not really sure how I would define those two terms. I should probably think about it some more before I you know, commit to some mm -hmm. definition. But the ideas I'm playing with now is that you, know, you could take any object and there could be a level of art to it. Um, and there could be a level of craft to it. I think, uh, you know, craft is more about the process of producing it and actually giving it physical form mm -hmm. and art, I think is kind of the, whatever the genesis of the idea was. Mm. So, you know, if, if I wanted to be semantic, that's probably incorrect, but that's just the feeling I get from it. Right. And, you know, of course I'll be asking every, every artist that I interview because I think, you know, everyone has their own working definition of it. And then right. ultimately there's probably, you know, the, the pra pragmatic definition and then there's the literal, you know, Oxford dictionary definition. Yeah. But like you said, it's, it's contentious because it's can be defined depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I would be fascinated to talk with, um, artists now and, find out when they made the decision per in their personal lives mm -hmm. to pursue because they did you know i know i know i can confidently say that <laughs> every one of them battled with those two words right and again going back to the circuit artist thing you know circuit artists to me are the kind of the epitome of of skilled folk at blurring the line between art and craft. Mm. Well, yeah. that's a perfect transition. So circuit okay. artists and art fairs. Uh -huh. um, when did you get into the art circuit? My first show was Jazz Fest in New Orleans, Louisiana in 2009. Okay. Yeah. Man, 2009 art oh. fairs, that was an interesting readjustment period, right? After, after the crash of 08, after the crash, I feel like yeah. just watching my dad go through, you know, that time period, just uh -huh. still running the circuit, right. you know, changed pretty fast. Uh -huh. um, 
So yeah, that's an interesting time to jump in. Yeah. And I didn't know any different. Sure. It, it was, was just my first exposure. I had six months prior to that made my, my first piece of furniture mm -hmm. using the same, I approached it materiality the same way I had done everything up until that point. Mm -hmm. It's just that I changed the function right. of it and where yeah. I was making sculpture and or jewelry. And then I started to make furniture. To Is act. that what you applied with? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What yeah. category did you start with? Um, cause I know furniture is a tricky one, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It what you make it out of and then, yeah. So I applied mixed media, right? Which is quote art, right? Yeah. Right. And you know, furniture is sort of the epitome of utility and function. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So jazz fest, I know that's a big show. That's a big show. It's and big I, show. again, it's top of the country, right? It's kind yeah, of up there. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and at the time I say that now with kind of this glow, but, um, at the time I didn't know, I knew it was a competitive show. I knew. Mm -hmm. And you got in first, first application first year. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Never was. I, I've only, I applied to that show seven times. I got into that show seven times. Wow. Okay. And, um, but yeah, I did not know the um, caliber of that show until really until maybe two years later, having done a number of circuit shows. Mm -hmm. um, and then people would, uh, you know, you just get to know the scene. And um, do you remember that first show getting there, setting up, you know, displaying your work? Do you remember what it was like? seeing the rest of the show and how it kind of defined you as an artist versus your experience in the formal education side of it? Yeah. Oh, very distinctly. I remember. Um, and the thing that, that is most, uh, indelible, the, the impression is how I felt like I found my people. Hmm. Um, as far as the other artists there, um, it's funny that I say artists instead of craftspeople. I, I, you know, I, and I back to that. I still do have a bias. For, I still have a bias. I, I have a hard time saying craftspeople, yeah, and I have yeah. a hard time saying art fair or craft fair. Yeah, because of the you know these associations that were given personally. You mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I. <clears throat> I've said it all my life, just, you know, art share, art show, art fair, mm. you know, craft artists, whatever, and never even thought about it. Right. Well, it's only now that I'm actually thinking, oh, actually there's, there's meaning attached with each one. Right. And, and um, if you, and there are some makers and that's the word I default to now mm -hmm. for me and for everyone else who's, who's using their hands to, uh, express their imagination and, um, but every maker will have probably really strong feelings mm -hmm. on those words, craft, fair, art, show, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I call us circuit artists, right. you know, as opposed to crafts people. And, you know, yeah. and so it's so weird and sticky. And right. Well, terms aside, we'll just, for the sake of, you know, talking about it, you can say whatever you want. The audience will just have to, uh, you know, know that there's more to it, yeah, but right. we'll just use terms that yeah. way we can get by in conversation. Yeah. And yeah. as we, you know, as we go along with this podcast and you hear from more artists, you'll, I guess you'll get more of a, a perspective on the terms and then hopefully you'll be able to separate the terms from, you know, the work that you're looking at. Cause yeah. at the end of the day, just evaluate the work. Right. Right. Yeah. But, uh, okay. So Jazz Fest first show, you know, you said you immediately knew that you found your people. Right. Yeah. Um, so far, the artists I've talked to, that's kind of one of the top two or three things is it's just the people, the mm. friends, the culture, yeah. the, yeah, that's, the, that's what makes it the tribe. I mm -hmm. call it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course I'd use that word or heard that word before ever saying it. Um, outside of the Native American indigenous people who are, you know, 
Well, now it's a buzzword. It's trendy. Yeah. So you can, you know, <laughs> again, it's taken on a new, <laughs> yeah, yeah, new meaning, yeah, 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 new yeah, reinterpretation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Well, 10 years ago, it, I'm sure the, the term has, uh, has evolved a good bit since then, but 10 years ago, like I said, I'd heard people say it, but never felt it. It's just, it yeah. felt like, a, it just felt contrived. Yeah. And, but once I got into Jazz Fest and was walking around and t- said, we're setting up because the setup is, a, you know, as you know, a big part of getting ready. Um, yeah. So for people that don't know, set up for an art show is typically you drive in in your van mm-hmm. um, Thursday before right. if the show starts on Friday. Yeah. You, know, you drive up, get in line. Yeah. <laughs> you figure out where your booth is. You walk yeah. over there. You say, okay, here's my square 10 by 10 yeah. <laughs> space. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. There's inevitably a fire hydrant in there or a drain or... Or some, someone who doesn't know how to park. Or, right. It's, it's always fucked up in some way. And you're like, all right, this is what we're working with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where you get to know everybody. Uh, yeah. And that is... Yeah. It's amazing. And it's amazing how smoothly or chaotically it can be but for the most part in the better in the shows with a strong reputation how smoothly it goes because most of those folks are they are incredibly uh focused and just aware people so yeah and you definitely know you can recognize the artists that have done yeah. it for many years yeah. you know a yeah. gun recognizes another gun <laughs> yeah right <laughs> you walk up and you're like all right yeah 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 um, yeah, but, but back to the um, the setup is an introduction to, and my first setup, of course, was an introduction to all the other artists, and then not knowing what I was getting into, and um, Do you but again, what? free for alling it, and I brought a graffiti artist with me because I was working with Found Objects, and right, um, and it was street finds, uh, specifically street signs. And a lot of them had been tagged. Um, they were all decommissioned street signs after Hurricane Katrina. But I, I brought in a graffiti artist and I set up my booth walls just as these blank slates and I let him do his thing. And um, that I didn't know that that was a big deal in a good way, but it was because everybody loved it and I got a prize and, you know, best booth because most <laughs> craft shows have their, um, are giving out prizes. Uh, and, but that happened multiple times where hmm. I was given that. And I, cause I, and I used that recipe, if you will, yeah. of this kind of impromptu. So like literally he was tagging in your booth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, so that's pretty cool. I, I think the, there's very few booths that kind of breach that, uh, I don't know, fourth wall, for lack of a better description of, it's like, this is still being made right uh, now uh-huh. while you're watching it, right? Most most booths, it's like everything's made and it's just on display. Mm-hmm. But once you kind of break that veil of, this is literally still in process, that's, yeah. you know, unique. Yeah, 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 yeah. More of an experience, yeah. which is what I was trying to create. Right more of an experience than a, um, yeah, similar to Meow Wolf, I guess. <laughs> yeah. As opposed okay, to a, yeah. ga- a gallery setting, Meow Wolf is somewhere between an experience and a gallery. Right. Okay, so for people that don't know, Meow Wolf is, I don't know, how would you, actually, how would you say Meow Wolf is an I mean, exhibit. it's new to me having just moved to New Mexico and never seen it prior to, you yeah. Know, but I would just call it an art experience. Yeah. Uh, it's know. in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And, uh, it, the early funding came from George R. R. Martin, who wrote game of Thrones. Right. So it, it's one of the, actually one of the things that's put New Mexico on the map, yeah. um, in recent years. Yeah, for um, sure. But, uh, so that's just a little background in case you hadn't heard of it. Um, let's circle back to hurricane Katrina. Cause I know that mm-hmm. impacted you, Sure. In a huge way. No, oh, yeah. And that was before you started doing art shows, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I guess, I guess walk us through what you were doing that you know right before, and then you know jump into it, and then f- how you came out of it. Right. So I was teaching at Loyola 
Um, the storm hit at the end of August and uh, school hadn't quite started. And, you know, mm -hmm. universities start at different times in different sure. parts of the country, depending on the weather. But um, school hadn't really started yet. Um, I didn't have a, because I was an adjunct professor, uh, it was contract based. And so contract hadn't been renewed, it, but because of the, especially because of the storm, it was eliminated. Um, and school was put on hold, university was put on hold. A lot of the students, student body, I know in Tulane and, and Loyola, they did their schooling in other parts of the country. There were, I guess, hosts to universities who were, who were taking the student body. And the teachers just kind of sat around for a little bit and figuring out, okay, what's going to happen? Because at the time, university, uh, New Orleans was, there was a, a lot of talk of it being like, it's not done. Gonna, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I, uh, as, as we've mentioned already, I grew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is it's a three hour drive north of New Orleans. So that's where my wife and I evacuated to, to her family's house mm -hmm. there. But within two days of the storm and the levees breaking, I was back down. Um, I did search and rescue. Basically, I, I got a 14 foot uh, flat bottom boat, a John boat we call them down there, and a 15 horsepower motor. And I freelanced uh, uh, just doing search and rescue. Wow. So did you have any qualifications before that or did you no, just jump right in? Just a hustle. They could just take whatever help they could get, right? Yeah, it really yeah. was. It was, and yeah, it was just, again, to use the word, it was a free for all. It was, wow. it was pretty amazing how it materialized. Sure. I mean, of course you have fish and wildlife and you have the army and the, uh, the air force and the, um, all of the first responders that are quote unquote qualified, mm -hmm. but then you have, you know, your, your the Cajun, citizens, right? Huh? <laughs> the citizens. The, yeah. Yeah. The civilians right. and the, um, the Cajun Navy was one term mm. that was sort of used <laughs> for the folks who, the coon asses who, who wanted to be a part of it all. And hmm. I'd never heard that term before. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that was definitely uh, a 180 from what you were doing and yeah. I don't know if you'd ever thought about something like that before or you kind of just jumped in and just felt like you had to do it yeah well I wasn't I'm, if I were to label myself it would be someone a hands on person and a person of action um, and so I wasn't just going to sit around and watch. Right. And from all of my, I'd done a lot of traveling. And if there's anything that I noticed that I learned from all the traveling and working abroad that I had done prior to Katrina, it was that what the news portrayed and what the reality of the situation was, was two mm -hmm. totally, totally different things. So, you know, I was like, what I'm hearing, I know that's not true. Even though, of course, that's not, and that's not to disrespect any journalist or, or newscaster. There are just many different, uh, many different ways that a story is portrayed, and so yeah. it's almost an impossible task to yeah. properly present, you know, an ongoing phenomenon, whatever that is. And so, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. So I knew that there was a way that I could um, help. Sure. And um, and I'm an adrenaline junkie. And based on what the news was telling us, it was a war zone. So I'm like, well, hell yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go into this war zone. It's my backyard. I know it like right. the, basically like the back of my hand. And there's <laughs> no way I can't figure out some way to sure. to um, to figure it out. Wow. So what was the, see, so you got that boat and you just, what, just hit the water, just started. I, I was able to figure out some, an approach cause I knew I wasn't just going to go down there and 
So what I learned through talking to folks was that you meet on the interstate about 60 miles outside of town. Mm -hmm. And that was the triage point. And you just say, here, here I am, I've got my boat and, and this is what I know. And, and then, um, fish and wildlife is really who organized us. Okay. Uh, so there's at least some sort of, uh, cohesion and you could at least report back to certain, some people at the end of the day or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, in the morning we would convene. They would line us out with a, a leader of sorts, mm -hmm. and um, and then during this initial morning meeting, they would say, "Well, you know, at at dusk, you need to be boat needs to be back off right. off the water, and and you need to, you know." But the thing was, we started. It was pretty much almost a twenty-four hour work period ironically or coincidentally I should say um, a lot like firefighting and um, at least I, anyway uh, to fast forward just a little bit because of Katrina and because of my search and rescue experience I realized I had an aptitude for first re I'll call it first responding turn it into a verb sure and um, I became a firefighter a year and a half later yeah right on so um yeah, that uh, that meeting in the morning, we you know learned what, again what we were going to do, and then we did our thing, and we came back in, uh, yeah, in the evening. Hmm. And it was a summertime, so it was it was a really long part of the year. It right. Wouldn't get dark till nine right. o'clock, but we usually we were usually starting about two a.m. Hmm. So that's yeah, that's another I'd say aspect of. You know your your life where it's like you're you're just about the action. It's like let's just go do something, and right away you just you talk to some people. You figured out you know where to go from there. Mm -hmm. A couple more collisions, you know, and mm -hmm. then boom, you're on a new track. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what a crazy track that is. It's yeah. not you know I'd say for a, you know for a visual artist to go from you know their their comfortable field into like you said, it was described as a war zone and mm. you're kind of on your own to some extent. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Mm. Well, thanks. Yeah. And I'm sure it was, you know, a defining experience in your life too. Yeah. And definitely, I mean, I have a history of doing things. I was a commercial fisherman and a bicycle messenger. And so, um, I'd always done things that were a little bit, risky for lack of a better word um and this was to me just an extension of what i already knew hmm. that's interesting that's we'll definitely have to uh talk a bit more about some of those other interesting jobs and professions i mean because it's it's interesting you know, seeing how you know, if you read your pedigree on your bio on your mm -hmm. website mm -hmm. they go okay you know I think I understand Ross, but then, mm. you know, talking to you, you're like, Oh wow. And so he's, this is just one small aspect of, right. you know, so it, I guess that brings me to the question, how would you define your career or your, you know, yourself? Like when you meet people, what do you say you do? Yeah. When I meet people, I tell them I'm a sculptor. <laughs> and that is it's uh, so funny how I, you, since I, at least for me, I'm a little bit now after speaking with you fixated on semantics and, um, I use that word because I know of the impact it can have mm -hmm. historically, as opposed to just calling myself a furniture maker. And often depending on who I'm talking to, I'll say sculptor furniture maker. I'll kind of sure. combine the, the two things. So basically I'm saying I'm an artist craftsperson, you know, it's right. like, yeah, I mean, yeah. well, that's, you know, that's interesting because it's hard to define yourself at any one point in time, right? You know, you're always changing and right. it's semantics aside. It's as long as you can convey, I don't know what you're about, 
Right. Right. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the audience will dictate the word choice. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, so I just, that's how I tip, I call myself a sculptor. And um, the neat thing about sculpture and the other sculptors that I know is that they, uh, they, yeah, they're always playing this. Uh, new forms, new ideas. Yeah, new whether mediums. between function and, and aesthetic, you mm-hmm. know. So, or an idea and a, and a function. Right. Well, we're right almost at an hour. What's your schedule? Got, got somewhere to be? Um, yeah, actually. All right, cool. So we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here for now. Okay. But as you, as you've heard, there's far more to Ross's story and <laughs> we'll have to sit down again soon and, you know, venture into the the later art art circuit years show circuit yeah, years yeah yeah, um, yeah yeah and then maybe go back into uh some of his other interesting professions yeah thank you so ross um where can people contact you if they want to or find find out more about your work yeah the easiest way is just rosslunds.com so r-o-s-s-l-u-n-z cool my studio name is skimmer studio S K I M M E R. Perfect. And and you're in Albuquerque now. Yeah, I'm based out of Albuquerque, cool. New Mexico. Yeah. I'll put uh, links where you can click on them. And uh, any questions for Ross, you can um, relay them to me through ApolloRoad.com slash podcast. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk to you next time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Alejandro. Apollo Road 003 in the books. Thank you for listening. If you listen to that entire hour, uh, man, I learned a lot. Um, I did not realize that Ross had so much more to his story than simply the artistic work that he's done. So inevitably I will have him back on the show at some point. If you want to support this podcast, please go to apolloroad.com slash podcast. Right now, uh, it's a labor of love. I am bootstrapping this thing and I've got a master plan and maybe I'll fill you in in the later episodes, but uh, it is involves much more than this podcast it's this podcast is just a small piece of my grand vision so you'll have to look forward to that thank you for listening again and we will get another interview up here shortly take care